Okay, back to why are we here today? All right, well, today we're going to be talking about a really big topic. We're going to be talking about something which stymied people in the late 20th century, the theory of everything. <laughs> what is the theory of everything? What is the theory of everything? Um, I'm going to leave you with a little bit of work to do today, dear viewer, because I can't actually tell you what the equation is uh, for the theory of everything, because nobody knows it yet, and I'm not a mathematician. Um, what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and give you a, a pointer as to the direction you could follow in order to uh, uh, finally achieve the theory of everything. Um, and then if you could name check me during your Nobel Prize speech, I would appreciate it. Um, so, the first thing is, what's the question? So, there's one way of thinking of the theory of everything, which is a kind of a weird science kind of way. So, you know, how do I pull Mary Jane? You put it into the equation and it tells you and, you know, you can achieve anything you want using the... Uh, the equation for everything, but that sadly uh, is not uh, what people mean uh, when they talk about the theory of everything. What physicists mean when they talk about the uh, theory of everything, they call it a gut or grand unified theory, is a mathematical construct which can explain all of the, uh, all of the physical processes that take place uh, in our universe. And we've done remarkably well in boiling down um, you know, what the universe is comprised of and how it works uh, to, to very few things. So we have uh, a few fundamental particles and we have four fundamental forces and everything that we, that we see is composed of those particles and those forces um, and we can predict uh, what will happen, if you like, uh, to various particles uh, just by applying the equations that govern those things. So the fundamental particles, I think there's 17, but I might be wrong, doesn't really matter. Um, they're the little bits and bobs that make up uh, the mass that we have uh, uh, around us and in us and, and all over the place. Uh, things like leptons and gluons and electrons and photons and all these kinds of things. They're, they're tiny ind indivisible uh, little uh, quanta, hence quantum, uh, of energy uh, which can't be divided any further. So that if you were to try and reduce their energy level a little bit, they'd just vanish. Um, and generally speaking, if, for instance, you have a fundamental particle that has a frequency of x, it can also have a frequency of 2x or 4x, but it can't have 1.5x. It's like um, a natural frequency in a skipping rope. If you jiggle it at the wrong frequency, it just jiggles, but if you hit the right frequency, it forms a, a standing wave, and that standing wave is what we perceive of as being a fundamental particle. Um, and there are only four forces, and the forces are basically resonances. So when you have a fundamental particle um, that you know, has a certain frequency, a certain amplitude, and say behaves in a certain way, it can form a, a resonance with another fundamental particle, which means the two of them then go on to share their fate thereafter. Uh, so for instance, an electron uh, passing a proton uh, will set up a resonance, uh, which means that the electron starts to orbit uh, around uh, the proton and um, an energetic particle that was moving a straight line at the speed of light suddenly becomes a static object which you can pick up and touch, you know, coffee mug, whatever. Um, so the four uh, forces, there are only four as far as we're aware, we have the strong nuclear force, uh, so that's the force that binds protons uh, and neutrons together in the heart of an atom. So you get a proton and a neutron and they resonate together and, um, and they resonate using a third uh, fundamental particle, a third kind of uh, type of wave, which is called a gluon, <laughs> who needs Latin, <laughs> and it sticks them together. And it sticks them together with a force that is absolutely, absolutely astronomical. I mean, the strength of the strong nuclear force is, is colossal. It's the strongest force uh, in, in the universe. It has a very short um, uh, sphere of influence. It's like a very muscly but very short arm, which as long as you're far enough away it can't reach you at all, but once you're within, pff, in you come, and it's almost, un almost unbreakable. You have the weak nuclear force, which uh, governs uh, nuclear decay, which is you know, kind of like radiation essentially. Uh, and then you have the electromagnetic force, which is the, the force that binds one atom to another in molecules and that kind of thing. And we rely on the electromagnetic force uh, to give us our substance. It's the reason why hands won't go through one another. Um, if I were to look at my hands purely as what's there, if you like, uh, the, the various constituents, the atoms that make in my body very, very widely spaced, and the chances are if I move my hands through one another, that none of them would hit, and that I would, I would just be able to do this. But because they have uh, electromagnetic attraction between them, if you imagine like a little spring, the little springs bounce off one another, and so when I you know, jump off a, a skyscraper and I land on the pavement, the reason why 
actually splatters because I can't pass through it because of the electromagnetic forces between the uh, atoms. So those are three forces, and then you have the fourth force, which is gravity, the mutual attraction of uh, massive bodies, which, which we're all uh, familiar, uh, thanks just to the generalised experience of our lives, that we wish to fall towards the Earth, and the Earth wishes to fall towards the Sun, and the apple wants to fall from the tree, and all that kind of thing. Now, the problem uh, with this nice, simple picture is that one of these forces is the odd one out. Um, three of the forces, the strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force, and electromagnetism, are quantum, which means that they work through a, through a series of maths used to describe the very small, used to describe these quantum particles, particles which can either exist or not exist, can only exist in certain energy levels but not in others. Um, you know, you have kind of like minimum lengths, you have minimum periods of time, it's grainy, uh, and, it's, uh, and these things have a tendency to actually pop in and out of existence. The fourth force, uh, gravity, is what they call a classical Newtonian force. Um, so it's a kind of a smoothly progressing force. The massive attraction, uh, the attraction of massive bodies doesn't appear to be quantum. It appears to be smooth. If you, you, know, if you draw your massive bodies apart, you get a perfectly smooth uh, kind of graph of attraction that diminishes with the square of the distance. Um, and gravity, uh, and the maths used to describe gravity, which is Einstein's theories of general special relativity, will not uh, coexist uh, with the maths used to describe the other three forces and the action of the fundamental particles. So the fundamental particles uh, require a certain degree of uncertainty, uh, they require that they can be quantized, um, whereas gravity won't do those things. And when you try and match the, uh, the maths up and you kind of mix your equations together, you end up with some anomalies. So anomalies in terms of physics are things like uh, infinities. So infinity is a, is a nice tool for mathematicians to use, um, but there's a sensation that actually if, you're, uh, if your calculations end up producing lots of them, that's because you made a mistake. Uh, because actually the, the truth of the matter is, is that um, the universe doesn't appear to be a place that contains infinity. You can go faster and faster, but eventually with the speed limit, the speed of light, you can go smaller and smaller until you get to a Planck length, and then it vanishes. Um, you can have a shorter and shorter period of time. You can have a lower and lower temperature, but eventually you reach zero degrees Kelvin, and you can go no further. So the universe appears to be a place which is actually bounded by fairly specific speed limits and fairly specific uh, kind of like things that can and can't occur, but not gravity. Um, so the real question, when we come to coming up with the grand unified theory of everything is how do we come up with the theory of quantum gravity, which is a theory that uh, allows gravity to be quantized, that allows it to be conceived of in a way that means it can match up with the maths that describes the quantum world. So there will no longer be this clear distinction between the world of the very small, governed by uh, quantum theory, and then the larger world, which we all have it on a day-to-day -day basis, um, which is kind of like more obviously susceptible to the force uh, of gravity. So. What I'm going to suggest to you is that if we could only understand exactly what gravity is and exactly how it works and what causes it, then that will allow us then to make the necessary psychological jump um, to marry the two together. Because once we, once we know what makes gravity, then and we can turn it, particularly if we can turn it into a quantum effect, then we'll be on the, on the road to a grand unified theory of everything. Okay, a little thought experiment. We're going to get a container, a shipping container, and we're going to fill it with light bulbs so that every surface of the shipping container is covered in light bulbs and they all illuminate the, uh, the centre of the shipping container nice and evenly. Perfectly even light distribution everywhere. I then take a tennis ball and I hang it from a piece of fishing wire in the middle of my container. And the tennis ball is perfectly evenly radiated and everything's all light and bright and shining. I then take a photometer, a little uh, device that measures the amount of radiation that's falling on its tip, and I hold it a long way from the tennis ball, and I get a certain reading, the amount of light that's hitting my photometer, and I find that if I basically place it anywhere at a large distance from the tennis ball, the reading's basically the same, because the room is evenly uh, irradiated. I then start to move my photometer toward my tennis ball, and I start to notice something funny happening, which is the amount of radiation that's falling on my photometer starts to fall. And the closer I get to the tennis ball, the more obvious this drop starts to become. 
until by the time I'm on the surface of the tennis ball, I have a reasonably significantly lower amount of radiation energy that's hitting my photometer than I did in the deeps of container space. And the reason for this is fairly simple. If you imagine that you're at one end of the container and the tennis ball is here in front of you, it's blocking out, say, one bulb from behind you. But as you approach it and the thing gets larger and larger, it starts to block out more and more of the bulbs behind it until eventually by the time that you're against it, it's blocking out half of the bulbs. Because it won't allow the light to travel through it, it means that you're then only being irradiated from light uh, from the back. And so as that light imparts its momentum to you, which is obviously imperceptible because it's so low, you're being pushed onto that tennis ball, essentially because the tennis ball is casting a three-dimensional quantum shadow in its vicinity. As you move away from the tennis ball, the light that hits you goes from being half, essentially, if you're on the surface, and then as you move away, the amount of light that reaches you from the opposite side of the tennis ball increases. And interestingly, um, it increases with the square of the distance from the tennis ball. So in the same way as the gravitational attraction of a massive body decreases with the square of the distance, the amount of radiation that massive body shields you from um, reduces with the square of the distance, which means that the pressure, if it's generating a pressure, should increase with the square of the distance. So as you leave the tennis ball behind, you find yourself coming into a, a more and more irradiated environment, an environment in which you're being impacted on all sides by light uh, radiation, um, more uh, thoroughly, if you like, and as you get close to the tennis ball, it reduces. Now, um, obviously, uh, a sheet of paper will block um, photons, it will block light, but then there are other things that pass more easily through matter. So, for instance, radiation from a, from a nuclear reactor, you wouldn't you know, build it inside of a greenhouse, it has to be inside of a large, kind of a heavy lead and concrete construction because radiation actually finds its way through matter. So it's probably better to imagine, uh, instead of a tennis ball, a kind of an opaque glass ball. And if you're on the surface of the opaque glass ball, there's less light reaching you, but some of the light from the opposite side of the ball reaches you, but just not as much as reaches you from the other side. And if you increase the size of the ball, um, obviously you, you know, the, the opacity of the ball increases, and so you get less and less radiation reaching you. If you have a heavier ball, or one that is more and more opaque, that has a greater density of uh, light-interrupting components, um, so let's say imagining uh, polystyrene as matter as opposed to lead, where you have the same, you actually have the same makeup, you know, the same leptons and everything, but they're more closely packed. And so radiation trying to travel through those gaps has more chance of hitting those, those protons and neutrons and of being disrupted and not reaching you. So there are ways in which you can allow more or less light to travel through the object. It can be larger, it can be denser. And what you do is you create a, a, a radiation contour in space, or in space-time, you want to see it that way. So you get what I would like to refer to as a quantum shadow. So a massive object, essentially, its main um, function is that it interrupts radiation. That's what it does. It stops radiation from passing through. It absorbs radiation, actually. You know, kind of the, the light hits the surface and the ball warms up rather than allowing the light to pass straight through. So if you had an environment, say, the vacuum of space according to Table Mark's calculations, which is irradiated with an absolute crackling firestorm of radiation. As you move towards the planet, you feel, you find that the amount of radiation reduces as you approach the planet. This would necessarily mean that the pressure that the radiation exerts on your surface also reduces, almost in exactly the same way as the water pressure on the ball. And in the same way as the ball wishes to float through that pressure gradient from the high pressure environment to the low pressure environment as it moves towards the surface of the pool, we too feel ourselves floating towards the spherical surface, if you like, of our lake uh, of energy. And that if you imagine gravity as being merely the quantum shadow cast by a massive object, which leads to the energy pressure of the background radiation as measured with the gecko and with the Casimir effect, creating this three-dimensional warp in the energy content of the three-dimensional space, you automatically float towards the ball. It's not attracting you. What's happening is it's absorbing energy from its environment, meaning that, that energy can't come through to the other side. Because whilst the background energy may seem to us to be formless because it kind of like affects us on all sides evenly, of course that energy is still moving in straight lines. There may be plenty of it. As I say, Tegmark's calculations suggest that it's absolutely uh, colossal. 
What that would mean is that as you left the surface of the planet behind, uh, not only would you be travelling up through a pressure gradient, which if you stopped pedalling, if you like, you would then fall back through to the surface, you would also find yourself in a more energy-rich environment. Um, and in the same way as if you place a core on the cob in an energy-rich pan of water, say one that's boiling, uh, the natural process of hydration is sped up um, because in a high energy environment you know, things occur more quickly than if you put it in a cold pan of water. The same is true as you head off into the vacuum of empty space, that you're actually entering a more and more energy rich environment. And as you enter that energy rich environment you'd expect the speed of reaction to increase. And it's also one of these strange things that we've observed that gravity slows time. That if you move towards a gravitating body or into a strong gravitational field that time appears to slow down. But as you move away from it, the time appears to speed up. And this to me suggests that you're moving from a low energy environment or a relatively low energy environment to a higher energy environment. So my suspicion is that actually gravity is a quantum effect. That, if, that the gravity is caused by the quantum shadow cast by the presence of a massive body leading to a pressure gradient uh, in the zero point energy uh, of space, which means that you have a tendency to follow those, those energetic lines. So instead of thinking it as a warping of space-time or some kind of like strange, you know, in, imponderable kind of like, oh, you know, the universe is so weird, it's actually fairly normal. It's more like a bath of hot water of even density with an ice cube in the middle. And the ice cube absorbs uh, the kind of heat radiation from the water, meaning that you get cool water near the ice cube and then warmer water further away. And if you put an object in that pool, because it's being bombarded by molecules, faster moving warm water molecules on one side and cooler, slower moving water molecules on the other, it will inexorably find itself drifting towards that ice cube. The ice cube is not attracting it, it's not a pull, it's a push. You're being shoved uh, towards the planet. This might explain why gravity is not a quantum force, why it has this smooth progression. And the reason it would have a smooth progression is because it's a resultant force. It's not because the planet is exchanging a force particle with you, which can only be broken down into certain quanta. What's happening is you're being bombarded by energy around you, and that's leading to a resultant force. So in the same way as if I have my cup, and let's say I had another pen, and I can throw the pens with exactly the same speed, what will happen is when they hit the cup is that they'll give it a certain amount of, uh, they'll impart a certain amount of momentum to it. But with two pens that can only travel at the same speed, you can only impart the same amount of momentum to the cup, I can actually achieve quite a few varying effects. So if I fire both of my pens on one side, I can give the cup two pens worth of momentum in one direction. If I fire the pens from opposite sides, I can give the cup zero momentum in any direction. And if I fire my pens coming in from an angle, I can actually create anything between zero and two pens worth of momentum of force transfer to that cup. So whilst my pens only have a fixed amount of, uh, of energy to impart, I can create a varying, uh, kind of infinitely varying, amount for momentum in my cup simply by firing them from different sides. So as I bombard my massive object with radiation from all sides, what I find is, is that even though the radiation can only have a certain figure, if you like, of momentum to impart, the actual amount of momentum that's imparted to the cup overall is perfectly smooth. And so the force of gravity, the resultant force of gravity, caused by the pressure differential in empty space, caused by the quantum shadow of the massive object, smoothly uh, delineates um, from high to low, uh, unlike the other forces which can only move uh, in a quantum way. But, having said that, even though it is smooth, at the same time it's still a quantum effect. It's an effect of the pressure created by quantum particles bombarding you from all sides, but bombarding you less from a side where a massive object is interrupting uh, these force particles. And I suspect that actually gravity is a lot like that. That the real experience of gravity is almost identical to the one of being under these scaffold boards, that it's the solvent, if you like, not the massive object that creates the movement and creates the force, and that the massive object merely creates the pressure gradient in the solvent by sh shading you, shadowing you, from a certain proportion of it from the side that's closest to you. That's how the gecko sticks to the wall. The gecko is essentially using a form of anti-gravity because the same force that is wanting to suck the gecko down, which is the pressure gradient in the zero point radiation, the gecko merely creates an even greater gradient in zero point radiation between its foot and the ceiling. And if you treat gravity that way, you'll find yourself coming up with a quantum theory of gravity 
and from there uh, you'll be able to progress to your grand unified theory of everything and then you pull Mary Jane just like you want to. What do you think? <laughs> I think it's brilliant. So, so basically, you're saying it's the absence, and not, you know, I, I understand it's now the absence of, um, of. I, I apologise if I'm using the wrong terminology. The absence of quantum energy mm. uh, enables uh, the movement towards. It's a, it's a vacuum, and in, in nature abhors a vacuum almost. It's it, the idea is that the vacuum of space which we perceive as being empty isn't, isn't empty yeah. it's actually chock full um, but it's chock full evenly in all directions which means there's no overall effect yeah. but if of course you can create an energy gradient then there is an overall pressure effect which is to fall down that energy gradient the massive body creates uh, the energy gradient by simply absorbing a certain proportion of the energy that falls on it meaning that it can't reach you yeah. So you're being hit from more from the back than you are from the yeah. front, and in you go. Immensely simple when you yeah. put it like that. Piece of <laughs> And you can get rid of all that space-time nonsense, the idea of the Earth's surface accelerating up towards you and all this kind of stuff, and it's just like, and it, and it makes perfect sense. You know, the, mug, the mug also has inertia this way and this way, because as I push it through the solvent, the solvent creates a higher pressure on the left than it does on the right. And if mm -hmm. I push it at the same speed as it would fall naturally, then you get the same resultant force. So actually, what we are, if you like, is we're like sea cucumbers living on the bottom of the Mariana Trench. And we're wondering, you know, like why our world is the way that it is. But we're completely unaware of the fact that we're totally submerged yeah. in an ocean. So it's so, fine. So just people need to have a, a greater awareness that um, nothing is not nothing. Yeah, nothing is nothing. In space is, is an is a energy rich. Holiday. Yeah. Energy rich, and because radiation travels in straight lines, and because massive bodies absorb radiation, it means that you can create radiation gradients, or massive bodies create radi radiation gradients around them, um, and you just fall down the pressure gradient, you literally just float as if you're floating to the surface of the pool. Yeah. And it's, it's nice and simple. This reminds me of a conversation we had ages ago on the sofa, actually, where you were telling me about quantum for the first time, educating me, and it was about the passage of a planet through space. Or Lines. Does that ring any bells? Yes, the idea that essentially the, the planet um, passes through space in the same way as a wave passes through the ocean, insofar as the planet, uh, the ocean doesn't move, it's merely the energy like going down a slinky. Yeah. So there's as much stuff here as there is here, but here it has a particular energy signature, and here it has a random energy signature. and what happens is that energy signature travels through the random energy signature. So my hand here is made up of a different part of the so field. Forms, the, the, as, as, as I understand it, the physical form of your hand or the planet moves yeah. um, through that um, matrix or whatever. Yeah. Of, of, uh, and it's, so like a, it's, like a, it's like my voice is reaching you, not because the air, yeah. the, the blow of my voice is reaching you. It's sending a shock wave through, through. the field between us and and it's being made up of a different part of that field yeah. as it goes. And our bodies are actually the same, they're just more densely packed. But as we walk along, we walk along the same way as the sound wave travels through air. So if, when I walk to the house in a minute to yeah. get more tea, then that won't be me, that won't be the me... That was here. That was here. No, you're perennially refreshed. But would it, would it be walking through the same spot as I regularly do on the corner of the house? Would 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 it, would I have been that person before? It, it, it would be it'd be nice to think of it that way, but what you've got to bear in mind is you're moving four thousand miles an hour oh, yeah, that way fine. anyway. Okay, yeah, yeah. So actually, your <laughs> your your passage through the field is like that. Yeah. Before you start, okay, and yeah, then yeah. you add like a little bit of that. <laughs> okay, well. cool. Maybe we should have, we can maybe do another well, no, another chat about that. So yeah, if you want to ask some questions about it, um, and I'll try and answer them. Yeah, we'll come back to it. Okay. So yeah, so it's 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 hard. It's hard to think of of the mug containing the same amount of stuff as the non mug. Mm. But actually, the only reason why the mug feels real and this doesn't feel real is because the energy signature of the mug resists the passage of my hands, whereas the energy signature of the non mug doesn't resist okay. the passage of my hands. Okay. Okay. So this may be for another chat, and you may need to educate me offline because this could be a stupid question. But where does the 
I refer to it as the DNA of that mug, how is that moved from that from one spot to another? Yeah. Okay, so the way that it works is like this. So the mug uh, is, is a load of trapped um, uh, oscillations, if you like. So you have a, at the beginning of time, you know, the universe begins and, and you get all of these kind of like standing waves forming. They all fly along and, and some of them come to make up the mug in the end. Um, but what happens is that uh, they, they start to, to form oscillations with one another. So, so, so a number of leptons like Clark, quarks um, would kind of come into contact with one another and they set up this kind of like um, harmonic frequency, you need know, pluck one guitar string and the other one vibrates. And they do it around one another. So the two waves, instead of passing in straight lines, just start to go round and round. They carry on going round and round at the speed of light. I mean, every, all, all of, we're all going at the speed of light, just going round and round in a straight line. And that thing then attracts electrons um, to the positive charge, and you end up with an object which is kind of fixed in space, as opposed to a thing that's travelling at the speed of light in a straight line. The kinetic energy of the object is the same, still going at the speed of light, it's just going round and round. Because the electrons that orbit it have a negative charge and they uh, repel other negative charges, if you get two electrons, you can actually push you know, one of them around. So, so you, can, you can move it um, from place to place through the field because it's, it's, it's repelled by the, by the charge of other electrons. So if we get a load of those atoms together and we make them into a mug, um, we now have like a load of standing waves, this kind of crackling, energy-rich kind of object, which is surrounded by, by the solvent which it is made. Um, and if I were to release some of the energy, it would explode and blow up be, because it would be an atomic explosion. But because my hand can't pass through it, because of the electromagnetic repulsion of the electrons, I can pick it up. And the only reason it appears to be here, it would seem less, it would seem less real, I suspect, if it had no weight. Imagine if it just floated around. But actually, it doesn't have a weight. It doesn't weigh any more than that patch of empty space. What's happening is, is that this, because it has a form and is being pressured on all sides unevenly, is simply being squeezed down through a solvent. What appears to be its weight is actually just the pressure of energy on top of it. Now, this section doesn't have a pressure of energy on top of it because it's, it's miscible to energy. The energy travels through it. So what makes a massive object a massive object? Almost its defining characteristic is that it resists the passage, or the straight line passage of background radiation. That's why I can see it. It's why I can touch it. And it's why it appears to have some heft. But actually, this area, which doesn't you know, resist the passage, is as dense, as full, almost, as this bit. It's like the water, I'm the merman. You know, here I am. There's my friend, we're playing tennis and we're batting the ball through what appears to be nothing. But if you actually did a sonar scan, you'd find that almost the entire environment was equally full. It's just the water doesn't resist the passage of the ball, the hand does. That's it. Cool. <laughs> Very good. All right, cool.